Mike, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us your time to share your memories of working with my grandfather and mum's father, uh, Johnny Douglas. We can't wait to chat to you. We're just excited to see you after so many years. It's been amazing. Been so, a long time. It yeah. certainly has. So, it's about Alice. 40 years since um, Spider-Man, hasn't it? Spot is 40 years on the 12th of September. I looked summer. it up. It was 81. So tell us, what um, memories do you have of working with Grandad in the sound box? Well, the main thing I do remember about um, Spider-Man is, is up, in, up until that point, animation was, was very low-key. They only used about six musicians. And it wasn't very spectacular, but it, it worked on the animation. And I think because of, because of the whole Star Wars thing that came out just few years before that, I think the animation people then decided that they had to have these big, you know, orchestras, you know, Brilliant. to match the, the movie films. You know. So oh. on Spider-Man, I mean, I think we had about 50, 60 musicians. So, I mean, they were, they were huge sessions. And I think, I think there was a lot of money involved, you know, because they, people put the money up to be able to pay for it. And I think it enhanced the um, these animations because it, it it made it filming. Absolutely, that, that's basically what I remember. That was the, the big thing. I remember being very surprised at the amount of money they were spending on animation, which was unusual. Wow, brilliant! Wow. And then Granda did a disco version. The version we've got that's available on a single it, single is referred to as a disco version of Spider Man yes. and His yes. Amazing Friends. I think they added a kind of like electronic drums and things on it, didn't they? It's very jazzy. I think, I think it. I think it was John's original orchestration with, with added yeah. disco drums and stuff like that. You know. What memories have you got <laughs> of Granddad and working with him? Well, I mean, obviously, John. John was was incredibly professional. He was always, you know, very right. This this has got to be right. But he never made mistakes. Every, everything was perfect. You know, the scores were perfect. He was perfect. Everything was just perfect. And he was very precise. He, he didn't stand for any kind of messing around with the musicians. You know, when he was up there on the podium, you know, all the guys were, were focused. You know, and uh, I mean, the, there was a kind of, they used to call, they used to call him the headmaster. Yeah, <laughs> that's and, it. Um, I remember that. <laughs> and, they, and they had a little nickname for him called Chalky. I don't know whether he ever knew he was called Chalky, but... I think he did, actually. Yeah, I think yeah. he did know. <laughs> he did. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think he was aware that so he, he was a bit yeah. And even, even um, you know, after we, we, we did we did all the recording on, on 24 track, and then obviously when the musicians had gone home, we then had to mix it. And I mixed everything with, with John in the control room. And he was very, very particular. He wanted to hear because he wrote he wrote a lot of solos. For people. I think he liked you know, musicians, and I think he gave all his favourite musicians a solo. And um, wow. he was very on the mixing sessions, he was very um, he wanted to get those solos through. So we were always you know, we were mixing, we were pushing, highlighting the solos because that's what he wanted to hear. Fantastic. But, uh, the other, the other thing I remember is because it was uh, it was a spider, obviously it was Spider-Man and Amazing Friends, it was a very kind of action, action type movie. And of course, John was known for his beautiful melodies and his wonderful string work. And the, the interesting thing was, it, it because it was a kind of, a, a, you know, a bombastic score with lots of action, he still managed to to put in those those lovely string melodies and woodwind melodies that he wrote, you know, as well as the excitement. No, he was very talented. And that was quite, and that was quite a neat and that was quite a neat thing to do. I think. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna have to all, go back and listen to the full animation soundtrack. It wasn't it. all crash. It wasn't all crash bang you know, there, was, there was a lot of music. You know, a lot of music. Yeah, there was lots of excitement and fun and speed and yeah. yes yes do you remember which studios it was all recorded in when you did the animations oh cbs 
We had a CBS. Oh, Whitfield. Is that Whitfield Street? We did everything at Whitfield Street. Oh. But, but, when, but when we did Spider Man, it was known as CBS. It didn't. It didn't become the other name until the nineties. Oh right, right. Because um, it, it was owned by CBS up until the nineties, and then Sony bought bought CBS, and then it became Sony Music Studio. Right. And then later on, it became Ripley. But oh, still, so that new owners Sony. again, or did Sony just change the no, name? No, still, it, it's all. It was always owned by Sony right to the end. But from a marketing point of view, they thought it was a good idea to call it Ripley Street Studios, because then it wouldn't put off other record companies using other outside. That makes sense. Companies. That makes sense. Otherwise, you've got the Sony the brand on their records, haven't you? Because it's recorded at yeah. studios. At Oh, that makes sense, and yeah. You can't have an EMI record that and record it at Sony Studios. It's a no-go. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. So I wonder how many years it took them to work that out then. But it was no... It took about 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How much business really? did they miss in those 10 years? <laughs> well, we weren't sure to work back then. There was, you know, so much recording back then. Not like today. Oh, I mean, everything cool. today is made in, in, in his home studio. Oh, it's incredible what can it's be a whole, It's a whole different business. But I remember being in the studios and Grandad listening for clicks. I bet you've had loads of that going on. And, he, and he'd hear something that none of us could hear. Oh, you? that was always one of the big things, recording live music with a lot of musicians. It were, were noises, page turns, uh, chair creaks, you know, squeaky rostrums, you name it. But we conquered it. We got through. Grant had such a tuned in, he'd hear this like yeah. strange sound yes. and find it and get it out and Well he was he was he was very, very fussy on the mixing session. Absolutely spot on. And and I admired him for that. I thought that was that was great because you know it was a challenge. You know, it made made me more interested. No, absolutely. I oh. mean, my main job is to, is to please the client. Yeah. You know, get the best, to get the best out of the sound on the tape. Well, we know, that we all, I remember definitely how much Grandad enjoyed working with you. He wouldn't, wouldn't want to be with anyone else. He wouldn't want you available. I, I, like, I like working with John. The other thing I remember is I don't think John worked with clicks back in those days, did he? What? No, click the track. Click. Oh, click, click track. Tracks. Yeah. Oh. Click tracks. And I think I think he can I think he conducted everything and set all the tempos himself. Yes. Oh yes, I think so. Yeah. I, I don't have any memory of using click tracks. Back no, I, mean, I don't think I don't have any memory of it either. Because now they now they do everything on a click track. Everything. Well, that's like, that kind of loses the room for expression, doesn't it? Yeah. A little bit. It's Absolutely true. right. Yes. Yes, it does. Yeah. Every, everything now is to click. Wow. But I don't, I don't think John, I don't think John was happy to be doing that. And I, I think that's why he never used clips. Because no. He set all the tempos, oh, yourself, did all the conducting. No, it would have been way too rigid for, for Grandad's style, I would think. He liked to blow and a And I think that's why he was able to write these lovely solos. If they weren't doing solos to click, you know, they were expressing them. Exactly. So that's one, one important thing I remember, Pre, pre-click yeah. days. Pre-click days, yeah. That's because all, all the movies I did from perhaps the mid-80s on, all to click. Really? Yeah. How many movies did you work on, Mike? Uh, well, according to the International Movie Database, it's about 82 last time I looked. How many? 82. 82. Because Grandad wrote the music for 30-something, 37, 38. Yeah. Day of the Triffids and um, uh, Crack in the World, Dolcema, the film Dolcema. Did you work with him on any of those? No, I didn't work. No, no, I didn't. So you, you, you must have been late. The only to films I, the only films I did with John were all the animated films, like you know, called Spider Man, which was animated Jones, series, yeah. Dragons, Transformers, Incredible Hulk. They're the ones that I remember. And it's an anniversary every year now. You must have done one a year with him 40 years ago. It probably was one a year. Because they've all got yeah. a different a different year date. So we've got yes. a 40th anniversary for the next five years. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, you know, it, it can take a year to write a score of films. It can be. I, yes. I know there are composers out there who write scores in two weeks, but I just don't know how to do it. It must be a stock stock thing, you know, you know where they kind of, you know, they have a template and they just take it out. Right. It's just an amazing talent. Whereas I, th I think John, I think John, when, when he sat down to write, he was like square one, wasn't it? it was like, yeah. But he had melodies okay. coming into his house. I remember him sharing stories with us that he would wake up in the night and there'd be a melody and he would write it, quickly jot it down. So he'd have just a few notes floating that worked and then he would build from that. And I know, I always remember as a child knowing he didn't like having the radio on because for him it felt like he had two radios on in two different stations because he had the music in his head and yes. then the sound elsewhere. And he that that was just a quirky thing that I remember. Really so it's just such a talent, isn't it, to be able to string notes together yeah. with rhythm and create he beautiful re things. He rarely used the piano. He, he, it was all literally all in his head. He didn't uh, down the tune out on the piano first. It was all in the head. And then he'd sit down and arrange it on the piano. It was I thought it was remarkable because he'd write it all down like a pen and pencil. I think I think on, I think with John it was it was definitely an art form. An art form, yeah. Mm. It was an art form rather than a job. Yeah, oh no! I mean. It was just a—it was like a natural was not passion, job. wasn't it? A, it was a, a passion, an art form. I mean, it was something he was—you know—he enjoyed rather than a job. Definitely, mm. yeah. It was yes, and yeah. he could do it anywhere. We would be away and sitting on the beach, and he'd be writing his yes, yeah, yeah. every anywhere. Such a skill! It's amazing, yeah. really. Terrific. An amazing skill and he just knew what he wanted and the sound he wanted to create and yeah fantastic really yeah he was he was um he was very, you know when we were mixing he was kind of very particular about sound you know he used to you know he used to he used to listen to the echo and the eq sound of instruments and he used to say to me you know i want that to glow can you, can, can you sparkle that you know? could you make that a little bit heavier but he, he didn't he didn't explain it like technically but i knew what he wanted because he was he was explaining it emotionally in a way wasn't it an emotional feeling you were able to technically create i had to kind of technically i had to kind of take his thoughts to take his thoughts and then turn it into, into technical stuff and then go from there we obviously had a great happy. working part he, he was always happy he was always happy with what i did so. He was definitely doing the right thing because once he met you, I don't think he had any other sound engineer from any memory that I've got. And you know, and you know, on top of all this, what we're saying, you know, he was such a lovely guy. You know, he, he was nice to be with. He was always, he was always nice to people. He never, he never got, you know, he never, he never sort of, like, you know, got in a temper or raised his voice or anything. He was so calm. And, and that was a pleasure. Him. Total gentleman, yeah. Total English gentleman. Yeah, no, definitely a very, very special man, and we're just thrilled that we can keep his legacy alive and his music alive. Well, it's wonderful. And, I mean, the work that he's doing is great. And people today can still love and appreciate, you know, the legacy that he's left, which is just fantastic. Well, Mike, it's been amazing chatting to you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate all this you've shared. It's just yeah, it's I enjoy it. It's always, always again. nice to talk about a nice man. It certainly is. Every time.